Hi, I'm delighted to be a part of this year's Noc Anglistów. And now, imagine you are a writer seeking to create a character who would have the following properties. Can be immortal, can be invisible, can be shape-shifting, would have transformative powers, be gender fluid, a brain hacker, would have mind uploading abilities, mind bending abilities, or time bending properties. Where would you look for inspiration? You don't have to go to a quantum physicist or consult NASA. It's enough if you look in your fridge, in your wastebasket bin, under your skin, or take a few steps outside your house. The potential characters are everywhere around and within us. They thrive, proliferate, die, they are reborn, they propagate, form alliances, listen, observe, they change, they are changed, they see us, and yet they remain mostly unseen. These characters are fungi, lichens, and mosses. In recent years, mushrooms have quietly become the superstars on the global stage. New books are popping up overnight. Mosses are less popular, but the few recent titles that we do have have already found their way into storytelling. I will now look at some of the properties of these uh, creatures, these beings, that could be interesting to a writer, and then I will look at some publications, some novels from the past 10 years or so that have used those incredible abilities to see how fungi, lichens and mosses are busy reworking literary imagination. So, fungi. Fungi are frequently described by what they lack. They don't have a root, stem, branch, bud, leaf, flower, fruit, bark, pith, fiber, among other things. And yet, the wor their world comes across as radically fascinating and extreme. They are record breakers in many disciplines. They are among the oldest living organisms that we know of. The oldest fossils are dated to 2.4 billion years ago. There are between 2.2 and 3.8 billion species. Uh, of fungi in the world, out of which only 6% have been described by scientists. At some point, they were the tallest form of life on Earth. Long time ago, the surface of the Earth was covered with these exotic looking prototaxites, reaching up to 8 meters in height. And then, along with the evolution of plants and animals, these prominent, striking and startling creatures have retreated more and more from view, and by today they have become mostly invisible. But for the fruiting bodies, the mushrooms, which we can find if we are watchful under our feet, on a walk outside the house or in a forest, or we can use it in our kitchen. But mostly they live their lives out of sight. They grow by producing hyphae, which are structures that branch and fuse and connect with other hyphae into a network we call mycelium. This is a structure that puzzles our accustomed understanding of reality. For example, they bewilder the boundary of the self. When watching the network structure of a mycelium, the sense of an individual seems to collapse. They are both one and many, singular and plural. They also make more visible the porosity of other bodies. They can interweave among plant cells in a leaf or a root. They colonize animal and human bodies and alter them. And yet, when hyphae encounter other hyphae, they are able to recognize if it belongs to the same mycelium or another with which it may connect or not. And this is when fungi bewilder also uh, the not just the self, but gender distinctions. They can have as many as 23,000 sexually compatible mating types, with which they connect with unpredictable outcomes. They also bewilder the boundary of life and death. Given the right conditions, they are potentially immortal. An entire mycelium can grow back out of a tiny fragment of a dying one. Fungi mine rocks for nutrients. They 
uh, turn inanimate, inorganic matter into living one. They are also masters of decomposition, assisting in the final stage of life. And yet there is no closure, no final ending, no finality to death. Because in the process of decomposition, matter is transformed and gives birth to new life. A mycelium is a never-ending process of growth, of expansion, of change and connection. It grows by feeding and yet this activity means something entirely different than in either plants or animals. While plants can make their own food through photosynthesis, fungi need to feed off others. But unlike animals who put food inside their bodies, fungal dinner takes place outside its body. And the larger the mycelium, the fuller the dinner. And now lichens. Lichens are a meeting of two different separate beings. Fungi that provide protection and food from the ground and algae or bacteria which draws energy from the sun. These partners exchange their abilities and lichens are the beneficiaries of this exchange. They are basically invincible. They can survive many kinds of extreme, the hottest and driest, but also the coldest environments. They can also survive extreme levels of radiation. In fact, they can survive radiation levels a lot stronger than those found in space, 24,000 times the level dose for humans. Lichens are also among the slowest growing organisms in the world, but can live a lot longer than most other organisms. They actually grow stronger as they grow older. So unlike humans, the older they get, the more likely they are to live even longer. Like fungi, lichens assault familiar concepts. They too can fuse the boundary of the self. Not only is one of their partners, fungi, already uh, troubling the category of an individual, but it now meets another partner with whom it forms a new organism in which the boundaries between them completely disappear. So as Scott Gilbert once said, um, we can say this is true not only for lichens. There have never been individuals. We are all lichens. And now mosses, um, my favorite. Mosses are among the very first plants that have made home on dry land. That happened about 500 million years ago. They arrived in a completely alien, hostile territory and made home in it. After algae had learned to capture sun's energy to produce oxygen and the ozone layer had formed, the algae that washed on shore had to learn how to survive in this completely new unexplored la land. We can compare it in a way to today's attempts to colonize Mars, but it was a successful uh, attempt for mosses. Today we know of 22,000 species living virtually in every ecosystem on the planet. Having carried a life in the shade of more flamboyant trees and flowers, they are now only begin beginning to emerge out of their hiding places and attract more attention. This could be because they are slowly becoming um, like a slogan for today's life. People are becoming more and more fed up with the flashy, exuberant life of the last decades and are looking for a quieter, more subdued existence. And mosses could be the living embodiments of the slogans that could be um, our new uh, life um, scenarios. Slow life, zero waste, co-opt, that's what we do. The, these most rudimentary, primitive of land plants embody minimalism and elegant simplicity. Mosses confuse the way we perceive time. They were the pioneers of vegetable life on land, giving beginning to trees, but then they also grow on a tree surface as it gets older and dies, assisting in its death. They are thus both before and after of the tree's life. What is more, they work on scales of time massively larger than human horizon can embrace. They grind rocks, they are symbols of ancient times, slowly, without haste, but with intention, 
to create the soil needed for other plants to grow, to take root. Now, reading a patch of moss, whether it's on a stony path or an aging cherry tree, is thus reading time, which is non-linear, which expands and is frequently at the mercy of the other. When there is no rain, a moss doesn't die, but it stops its living functions. It can lose up to 98% of its moisture and stop its living um, properties, processes. And then after four years, when it gets soaked again, it can renew and regain its life. It is in this fragility and dependence on the rain where lies its strength. While more advanced plants die from the lack of um, water or excess of water, a patch of moss can recover its activity and uh, survive. So what have writers done with all this knowledge of mosses, lichens and fungi? I will now look at a few titles to give an overview, some kind of an example, but these are not all the texts that we can find today. Um, so as far as immortality or time bending, um, I would suggest Jeff Vandermeer um, and his novel Dead Astronauts. It presents a radical vision of a post-apocalyptic reality. In a Groundhog Day-like scenario, uh, there are three astronauts who visit different versions of the same city. They, they attempt to save the world, and this attempt is reenacted all over, every day, in a fight against the company, which stands for capitalistic exploitation. One of the three astronauts, Moss, is a biotech character, and she can shape-shift between human and plant forms. Her construction is based on the botanical knowledge of the plant's nature and origin, and she puts forward the so-called tidal, um, uh, tidal pool rules for survival. Stay still, be small, bring the right camouflage, be tiny, be motionless, take your time. If we look at these rules, they really describe most physiology, because being unable to run from a predator, stillness for mosses, is their best weapon. Being a plant, moss escapes the constraints perceived and measured in human span. She has access to parallel worlds, present, past and future, where she can transport her friends. She can be at the same time the youngest of the three, regenerating and growing back from the smallest part while the rest of them have been damaged or killed. But at the same time, she is ancient. Her history as the first plant on Earth is hinted at when she enters the city and faces dust apparitions in the sand. That would remind any reader of uh, the description of the Valley of Ashes in Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. The reader learns that Moss has the closest affinity to those apparitions since, like the first terrestrial plant, they looked, that's a quote, as if they had emerged not from desert but from some vast and ancient sea the taste of them registered Paleo-Mesozoic. So this reference is both to Moss's origin as the first descendant of algae on land and also the time of that move. Her being the oldest living plant is also acknowledged by Botch, a giant ancient leviathan of a fish, which is reminiscent of uh, a figure in Hieronymus Bosch's famous painting, who lives in a pond where the company refuse ends up. Botch fears the unknown, watchful nature of Moss more than the cruelty of the company. But she explains to him, quote, In time, you will be as you were hatched from an egg, new, curious, and I will be the old one, and you will be the start of something new, again, through time. Moss hears bewilders the notions of young, old, before, after, and the notions of death and alive. She's also, what's interesting, gender fluid. She can be a female lover to Chen and male lover to Grayson, the other astronauts, um, basically showing that the plant world uh, doesn't have such distinctions uh, 
they, they are not as solid and permanently delineated. Um, another offer that uses Moss's properties is Les Ziemska. Um, she was inspired to write her story, The Mushroom Queen, reading uh, Paul Stamets' 2005 book, Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Help Save the World, which basically heralded the beginning of the fungal turn in the humanities. The story presents a woman living in an American town, bored with her marriage and life and ready for adventure. Then there appears out of nowhere her doppelganger, a mushroom which assumes her shape and takes her place in the house, while disposing of the original woman underground, turning her into a mycelium. Both women need to adjust to the new conditions, to the new reality. The mushroom woman's human form is almost a perfect copy, yet certain details uh, and differences persist. Like, for example, she had no pores, just spores, her earlobes haven't formed perfectly. Um, and the point of view in the story shifts between them and two little dogs uh, who can sense the change between um, uh, the two women better than the husband, who is quite happy uh, with the small improvements in his marital life. The mushroom woman wants to taste human love, and yet she realizes it had tasted a lot better in the books she had consumed. So eventually, being a fungi, she dissolves the house and its inhabitants. And the original woman um, um, at first tries to return to her previous life, and yet with time begins to enjoy her new spread out immortal state. And now um, I want to move to uh, fungi and uh, their brain hacking uh, abilities and also uh, immortality. Uh, in M. R. Carey's The Girl with All the Gifts, um, there is a cordyceps fungi, a species of fungi which is infamous for attacking ants hacking their brains and tur turning them into spore-carrying zombies. In the novel, the fungi has adapted to infiltrate human bodies and turn them into prosthetic devices for further growth and dissemination. Humans responded uh, by employing the best scientists to defeat the, the pathogen. Soon, however, the pandemic gets out of control. What happens is, the humans infected with the spores almost instantly turn into the so-called hungries, body shells whose agency is lost and the fungus mimics the brain's neurotransmitters and hijacks their bodies. There is, however, a group of children born of infected mothers who are human-fungi hybrids. They can talk, think and feel despite the fact that mycelial threads are present throughout their nerve tissue. And yet, as soon as they sense human smell, they act in the same way as other hungries. That means they want to bite and infect those humans. One of the children is Melanie, a highly intelligent hybrid 10-year-old, who soon becomes the main agent in the novel. She's kind and willing to help others, which cannot be said about the human scientists, and her immunity gives her more freedom uh, to move than any other human characters in the novel. And yet, when she sees the fruiting bodies of the hungries consumed by the fungus, she understands the scale of the transformation and sees that nothing can be done about it anymore. She accepts it and eventually speeds up the transformation of the life on Earth by setting fire to the sporangia to facilitate the dissemination of the spores. The world becomes uninhabitable for the humans and only habitable to the children like her. And uh, another novel which uses uh, brain, uh, brain hijacking um, fungus is Mexican Gothic uh, by Silvia Moreno Garcia. Uh, it uses uh, the fungus that infects cicadas and drives them into a mind controlled hypersexual frenzy. It infects the cicada, eats, eats its gonads, grows inside it, turns its insides into a yellow powder, and eventually makes the cicada's bottom fall off. 
and spread the spores to infect other cicadas. Mosospora cicadina. The cicadas so infected are still singing as their body is consumed from within. They are singing, calling for a mate, even if they already have that. The action of the novel takes place in the Doyle's household, High Place, uh, which is a desolate, forgotten by civilization place, cold and unwelcoming. It turns out that the place is overcome by the deadly mycelium and its inhabitants. The Doyle family try to cooperate with the fungus to stay alive. Um, they upload their memories uh, onto the mycelium in the house, which the fungus can store and in this way preserve the family history. A visitor to the place, Noemi, slowly realizes that she's being watched by the fungus and is slowly being, being overcome by its powers. An interesting image uh, which is present throughout the novel is um, that of a snake that it's eating its own tail. We can say that in that same way the Doyle family, while using the fungus to stay alive, to preserve immortality, are also destroying themselves, sacrificing family members to the deadly fungus. So their immortality really comes at a very high price. And now I want to shift to the transformative powers of the fungus. And uh, I will look at Richard Powers' novel, The Overstory, um, in which the most visible characters are trees. And yet it's the invisible fungi that play an important transformative role through decomposition and decay. Decomposition and decay have been an important part of Gothic and weird literature. In Gothic novels, they help to create the atmosphere of gloom, which was frequently coupled with the character's moral decay. Uh, in early weird fiction, they served to place the human characters against the natural world, which was a source of horror, which was an enemy. In the overstory, fungal activity is however recognized as essential part of the cycle of life on Earth. One of the characters, the dendrologist Patricia Westford, opposes the practices of clearing the forest floor of rotting logs. She understands that a healthy forest must need dead trees. So she recognizes the communal aspect of decay and the transformations happening in that space. She says, I sometimes wonder whether a tree's real task on earth isn't to bulk itself up in preparation of lying dead on the forest floor for a long time. She believes that dead logs are far more alive than the living ones. So decadence can no longer be connected with the word decay and clearing the forest floor is no longer an activity required for purging human moral depravity. The rot is beautiful in and for its own sake. The overstory ends with a vision uh, in which life proceeds with its happy exuberance. Another property that fungi can give us uh, in literature is time bending. In Jeff van der Meer's The Sudden Reach Trilogy, in the background of human-caused pollution and devastation of the natural environment, there appears a world in area which erases the impact of human activity. Here, anything human deteriorates at a very high speed and mutates to blend in with the pristine wilderness, including humans themselves. Uh, the main heroine, the biologist, enters the area as a part of a governmental expedition to investigate into uh, the place. She examines words uh, written on a wall of a mysterious structure in the ground, a tunnel the biologist cannot help viewing as a tower. The words that she looks at are made of organic matter, which at first glimpse resembles rich, green, fern-like moss, but it's in fact a lichenized organism. This dual nature of a lichen is mirrored uh, in the very image of the tunnel uh, where the words are found, because the tunnel is complemented with an image of a lighthouse, uh, which is a mirror structure whose stairs and ceilings are of the same width, the same shape, only turning upwards rather than downwards. So the lighthouse upwards movement 
is like the striving of the plant part of a lichen towards the sun, and the downward movement of the staircase in the tunnel is like the um, movement of the fungi into the deepness of the soil. The biologist examines samples of the lichen script and notices layers of earlier ghost scripts which have been overwritten. This is in miniature the work that Area X is carrying out within this part of Florida landscape, erasing human traces and creating its own layers of a pristine, wild ecosystem where human beings and their creations are reduced to a ghostly appearances beneath or within environmental forms. So we can find a dolphin hunting uh, with its human eyes, um, a moaning creature in the marshes, or the remains of a village that had sunk into the natural landscape. The process of erasing human traces happens at an accelerated speed, and the natural world hijacks the area completely. Um, so, in conclusion, um, if you are a writer seeking for a character with superhuman powers, look no further. They are here, all around us. Fungi, lichens and mosses. They are magnificent, invincible and perfectly fitted for survival. They could become our new role models. Thank you very much.